Mites. While we may not think about them in our day-to-day, they are all around us. On our carpets, in our pantries, and even on your face right now. But most mites are completely harmless or even beneficial. Not all, but most. Welcome to the Insect Spotlight Project, a channel dedicated to shining a light on insects, spiders, and any other creepy crawlies that get left out of the ecologic spotlight. Today, we're talking about the subclass Akari, better known as the mites and ticks. The reason I use quotation marks here is because recent research seems to show that Akari is not a monophyletic grouping. A monophyletic group in taxonomy means that everything in the group can be linked back to one common ancestor, with no outsiders included. For example, beetles seem to be a monophyletic grouping, all beetles can be traced back to one common ancestor with no non-beetles shoved in between. Akari seems to be polyphyletic, where they cannot be cleanly traced back to one common ancestor. I thought a lot about how to handle this for the sake of the channel, and decided I would still proceed and do a video on the Akari as a whole, and then do more specific videos on monophyletic orders of mites and ticks down the line. However, I encourage anyone interested in taxonomy to take a closer look at the phylogeny or evolutionary history of this group. Catalogoflife.org is a great resource. Now that we got the formalities out of the way, let's dive into what you really came here for. So what is a mite? Well, mites and ticks are arachnids, and I wish I could tell you that means they all have eight legs, but some mites have six legs and some have four. However, because they're arachnids, they're not going to have any wings or antennae. Mites and ticks have two main body regions, the nathsoma, also called the capitulum, and the idiosoma. The nathsoma contains the whole mouth region. This is where you'll find the pedipalps, small leg-looking appendages used to manipulate prey or sense their surroundings, and also the chelicerae, used to grasp or pierce their prey slash host. The idiosoma is the larger part of the arthropod, and that's the thing with all the legs sticking out of it. The Akari are also incredibly small. At their max, you can find them around a centimeter and a half, and at their smallest, you're looking at more like a tenth of a millimeter. And they are also incredibly diverse. Right now, we have around 40 to 50,000 mite species described. And given their incredibly small size and the lack of study into their diversity, there could be millions yet to be discovered. The mite life cycle is generally described as a four or five stage process, going from egg to larvae to nymph to adult. Sometimes that nymphal stage is split into proto-nymph and deutonymph. This isn't like a caterpillar into butterfly situation. Mite larvae, nymphs, and adults all tend to look somewhat like a mite. However, it is not uncommon for different life stages to have different niches. Mites may be parasitic in their larval or nymphal stage and then become predatory as adults. Or they might move from different hosts as they progress in their life cycle. Once adulthood is reached, male ticks and mites will often create spermatophores, neat little bundles containing the sperm to be uptaken by the female for fertilization. Some mites will also practice parthenogenesis, where females can create perfectly viable eggs without fertilization. In terms of ecology, many acarids are parasitic. One that may immediately come to mind are the ticks, parasitic bloodsuckers feeding on mammals, birds, and other vertebrates. Ticks will often feed on different hosts depending on the stage they're at in their life cycle, feeding on smaller animals as larvae and nymphs and working their way up. Invertebrates aren't safe either. There are plenty of acarids that feed on insects and other inverts, such as the infamous Varroa mite, which feeds on honeybees, or the Erythraeidae, which feed on a variety of arthropods, such as harvestmen. Side note, the Erythraeidae also contain the sidewalk mites, those tiny little red dots you see crawling around on the concrete. Uh, they're perfectly harmless, by the way. Even the plants aren't safe. Plenty of mites parasitize plants, such as the Areophyidae, which are the gall-forming mites. Let's talk about galls for a second. Mites aren't the only ones that form galls. Plenty of wasps, flies, and aphids do the same thing. Galls are basically plant tumors. The mite causes irritation in the leaves or stems of the plant, and the plant, in response, creates a growth of plant tissue in that area. 
This is exactly what the mite wants, as it then feeds on that newly developed plant tissue. Some plant feeding mites are a little more direct, such as the spider mites, which puncture plant cells on the leaves to feed. But at least they haven't colonized the aquatic systems, right? There are plenty of species of water mites. They can be found in anything from freshwater streams and ponds to the deep ocean floor 7,000 meters below. And if they were able to colonize the deep ocean depths, you know they've found plenty of ways to establish themselves in our developed areas. Dust mites can be found worldwide, scavenging our homes for dead skin cells and other organic material. And don't forget the flower mites, which have found great success feeding on stored grains in our pantries. There are also the face mites, tiny mites in the genus Demodex that feed on the oily secretions on our face. Most people have Demodex mites living on them, but don't freak out. They're peaceful residents. They're rarely a problem. Most of the time, they just clean your face. But not all acarids are as peaceful as the face mites. Many acarids come into conflict with humans in some pretty serious ways. Disease is a big one. Ticks can spread a variety of diseases, such as Lyme disease and Rocky Mountain spotted fever, but they aren't the only culprits. There are also chiggers, small reddish-brown mites that bite at your ankles and cause itchy red bumps. In some tropical areas, they can transmit a disease called scrub typhus. Dangerous, yet treatable. Some mites can infest the skin and cause various dermal issues. Scabies, for example, is caused by burrowing mites, small acarids that burrow into the skin and cause intense itching. I'm gonna pause here for a second for an important message. Mites are small, hard to see, and often creep people out. So as we talk about the medically important ones, I think we need a brief lesson on delusory parasitosis. Delusory parasitosis is a mental condition where people have a deep-rooted belief that they're infested with some sort of parasite, despite no perceivable evidence by medical examination. This parasite paranoia is incredibly dangerous, and often stems from other mental illnesses. It can lead to highly irrational and hazardous decisions, such as bathing in bleach or violent itching. If this sounds familiar for you or a loved one, please seek medical attention. These mites can be scary, but modern medicine has done a great job at providing treatments for these diseases. I should also mention dust mites before we leave this medical segment. They don't spread any diseases, but they can cause allergic reactions. It isn't all about disease, though. Some mites can cause issues in our agriculture, too. The Varroa mite, the bane of all beekeepers. Our arms race with Varroa mites has been ruthless and ongoing. These mites originally evolved feeding on Asian honeybees and have since host hopped to feed on our Western honeybees. These mites spread a variety of bee viruses and can easily cause the collapse of an entire colony if not kept in check. There are even mites that are specialized to live in the trachea of bees. So yeah, happy to be human. We should once again mention the spider mite. Small herbivorous mites that feed on a variety of plants and create silken webs to protect themselves from predators, hence their name. In small numbers, these mites aren't really a threat, but their population can quickly grow and overwhelm a plant. Ironically, one of the best defenses against spider mites is the deployment of predatory mites, navigating the silky environment and feeding on all stages of the spider mite life cycle. Plenty of mites are also important detritivores, doing their part to recycle nutrients throughout the environment. So while it's easy to think of acarids as the enemy, you have to remember this is a massive group of arthropods. Most of these acarids are not well understood, and it's only natural that the ones that pose a problem to us get studied more intensely. And as for the conservation side of things, mites fill so many niches that basically anything positive you do for the land is probably going to help at least some of them. Whether that's planting native plants, conserving leaf litter or coarse woody debris, or taking care of the water on your property, the mites will thank you. Thank you all so much for listening. If you enjoyed the content, please remember to like and subscribe to keep up to date with future orders. And if you have any favorite species or fun facts about this group I didn't cover, or any personal experiences with mites and ticks, please leave them in the comments below. I'd love to hear about them. Peace, y'all.